So, Freaks, it's your boy Marty here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. I sat down with Patrick Dugan again, second time he's been on the podcast, to talk about a bunch of things, including financial action task force, regulations, uh, things that are going on in Chile, and the future of Bitcoin. How's it going to look at the protocol level, at the regulatory level? Very interesting back and forth for an hour. I think you guys are going to like it. This episode is brought to you by good friends at the motherfucking Cash App. You should know all about the Cash App. If you don't know about the Cash App, let me tell you about the Cash App, okay? Cash App is helping us stack sats, send sats, sell sats, and receive sats. Uh, we're saying sats, 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 because sats can be the standard on the app. Uh, we're stacking whole sats instead of fractions of Bitcoin. Huge mental hurdle to get over is the unit bias buying a fraction of bitcoin versus hundreds of thousands millions tens of millions of sats for you freaks who are unaware there are 100 million sats in one bitcoin uh, on top of that you can dca in the sats you can set and forget if you want to buy daily weekly or bi-weekly you can set auto buys within the app so you can stack sats without even thinking about it just set it and forget it on top of that you can stack slivers of stonks if you want to, if you're into the stonk market, you can buy as little as $1 of your favorite stonk on the Cash App. Uh, because all this is connected to your bank account, there's no four, four to five day waiting period. Start stacking sats or slivers of stonks today. Cash App may even be your bank account. They're offering account numbers and routing numbers for individuals who like to get their paychecks direct deposited into the app. They also have a nice debit card that is accepted anywhere Visa is accepted, the boost card uh, that allows you to go to partner merchants, initiate your boost, and save money. Cash App, Bank of the Future. If you haven't downloaded the app, what are you waiting for? Go do it. And when you do do it, use the code Stacking Sats. It's S T A C K I N G S A T S. You're going to get ten dollars, and ten dollars is going to go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. That's Owls Lacrosse. Enjoy this episode. Hope you freaks have a lovely day. Enjoy the day. Throughout all this chaos. Find some pleasure in life. Take care. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here on a lovely Friday morning. About to talk about a bunch of stuff. Chile. Uh, the Financial Action Task Force, potentially some layered Bitcoin composability. I'm sitting back down with Patrick Dugan. Patrick, how the hell are you doing? Doing great. Uh, it's it's actually been a good 2020 for me. I've managed to uh, keep my business going and uh, keep developing, getting closer to launch. So I'm very excited about all that. And uh, holding a little bit of coin, Bitcoin's up. That's always fun. Always a good vibe. Pump pumping this week i think we're early in a bull market i feel like this is uh pretty much november 2016 in in fractal that's my hope anyway right as i hodl how high will it go um okay so there the the shit coiners generally like to say it's going to be a, only 60k but the um the the bitcoin tina side of things are saying gold market cap parity Right, <laughs> um, which is six mid six figures. So it's gonna. I think it'll be somewhere in between those two. Yeah, the uh, yeah, mid uh, five hundred grand a coin would be hilarious if we get that. Um, yeah, people would lose their minds. Too. Rich people who think they're rich, and then they're like, "Wait a minute, this fucking thing's half a million dollars. Are you kidding me? Like, I need to allocate a little bit." Of course, at, at 500K, what's your upside? You could double it to a million, you could 4X it or something. You know, it's not as crazy. But it, on a percentage compound basis, if it's 10% or whatnot, or 20, uh, it out, outperforms S&P, then yeah, you could still see cyclical. But also my, my whole thesis is Bitcoin dollarization. That's what I've tried to do with TradeLayer. Uh, that's what I want to do with future 
got, you know, influencing Bitcoin's evolution in some ways so that people can dollarize. So there's always a use case for buying Bitcoin spot, hedging it and dollarizing it as the new US Treasury bond in some way uh, for some yield, right? For some fixed yield, um, which is which there's a lot of money in the world, a lot of trillions that's very hungry for that. So that makes it credible to imagine, well, like why would somebody buy Bitcoin at 500K after you've hit whatever benchmark to keep it alive and keep it going? Uh, and it would be for this, right? Um, but then of course the people who are long, the futures need to have some upside to compensate, you know, that cost of capital. And it kind of balances out as a uh, totally new financial systems based on equity positions instead of debt. It's a beautiful thing. It is very beautiful. What do you think about lightning pool? In the, oh, uh, I loved it. Yeah. And I, I love how um, it's an atomic thing that you just structure it into the, the, the transaction itself. And then the, the time lock primitive and the differentials in, in outputs will pay that repo yield. And, and it's all, it's all there. That, that's my favorite thing. So like with trade layer, since we talked last, I basically at 5 AM on a Sunday morning, scratching my head, like, okay, we're running a lot of funds. Like we're not going to get to do a big side chain. We're not going to, you know, lose the liquid. So how do we get the high scaling throughput? How do we match people quickly? And I figured out this finality when you co-sign and it was a revelation. And so we built this future trade channels. So it's kind of like the idea behind lightning to two multi-sigs, but with tokens or, or these sort of uh, account based contract positions you can take in, in the trade layer, these derivative positions. Um, so you can trade those two. And then I figured out how to do it with, with actual UTXOs and it was very clever. And this was the, the next breakthrough, right? Because of course we need the spot liquidity to be there and against stable coin or what have you uh, to make that interesting. Um, the liquidity of Bitcoin is a big bull to catch a ride on. So of course to bootstrap any DEX, it's a great thing to have. That's why there's so much WBTC with BitGo uh, as making uh, Ethereum the new Poloniex or, or something like this, uh, which, which brings me to the big point that I want to kind of touch on over this conversation, which is how do we govern Bitcoin? Who doesn't want to be when it grows up? You know, what's the middle ground between this AML versus uh, taproot collective mixing uh, dialectic? Um, and are we in, have we endangered Bitcoin by being too conservative about upgrades because we've got different ideas about economics. We don't think these features are important. And now, we're entrusting so much of the money supply to regulated custodians who are going to be even more regulated, BitGo and Barry Silbert's uh, Trump fund and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? Even like Avanti, which is great. It's like the regulated, you know, so let's get all, let's get most of the Bitcoin in the hands of these regulated custodians maybe is, is a failure. Maybe that backfires and we should be a little bit more daring to do, to, to do better. But, but with yeah. the lightning, so with the lightning, they've got the money market. This is something that Nick and I, uh, Nick Carter and I talked about the first time we met in person at a uh, consensus, and, like they're going to have to do a lending market in order to, sh to sh shuffle that whole capital redundancy thing. Um, so I think it's great for that. I expect the rates to be low, lower than what you would get, let's say buying Litecoin and selling uh, Litecoin BTC futures for premium or other ways of uh, harvesting yield, uh, certainly lower than lending your Bitcoin, uh, where those rates are like 5%. I'm, I'm thinking it'll be like Nick Batia's, uh, Nick with the K now, different Nick. Uh, Nick Batia's thing was like 46 basis points. And I could see there being, with the durations that they're doing, you could lock it up for, it would be kind of like um, in Chile, they have UF time deposits that pay these low amount of basis points and it's an inflation indexed unit. Um, and it pays more than the dollar deposits do as well. Those pay like nothing. Um, and so it would be like that. It would be like the ultra low risk uh, Bitcoin repo rate. And it's a great thing for the industry and having a clearinghouse model then where we can, we can sort Bitcoin around uh, and get some scaling factor. It's, it's really clever. Um, so I aspire to that. What I came up with was um, instead of the reference address having a dust, you would make that like one Litecoin and the offer turn says, you know, you're selling me 
uh, 60 stable coin, let's say Litecoin 60 bucks for, for this Litecoin, right? So you just use the fund raw transaction RPC. It goes through the wallet and grabs the other inputs and uh, makes it complete. And then you got a cosign to book it. So that can all happen very quickly on low latencies, faster than what centralized exchanges are doing now. Um, so I'm really into changing market structure and, and better price discovery. Unfortunately, dot, 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 I've had to compromise. about you know metadata and such about what goes on so let's talk about that yeah let's jump into it yeah i actually just lost you for like 30 seconds oh you, lo uh, you lost me where, on signal yeah where you said i lost you at uh we had to compromise oh yeah so the compromise was basically there are kyc hooks in the protocol there's a default hook because, you know, this is Bitcoin. This is pseudonymous, um, Sybil prone wild land where there's, a, you know, a very large number of potential addresses anyone can generate. Um, so the, the default option that I compromised on was you can assert that you're, you're resident in a jurisdiction, which is sort of implied in this, this default, this KYC zero. Um, and you self certify that. And if you're lying, shame on you. And maybe you could be found liable for that. Like for instance, if you're a U.S. resident, so please don't, you know, tempt fate with that. But like if you're resident in Chile, you can trade derivatives, for example. So you could just self cert and then you have maybe, well, you're trading with people that don't have, you don't have rigorous KYC on, that's not great. Um, then there are white lists. And so we can have different levels of white lists. We can have international people um, where you've got at least some ID and you know that, so that's like pretty cool still, but obviously there was some friction involved and building a list like that or a few lists would be very valuable. And then you get down to like, okay, here are the accredited investors, here are the eligible yada yadas and so on. Um, and that way people can trade in the US. Uh, it's a big problem right now. The derivative space is very fragmented in the US. Um, so I think we need both basically. Yeah. So let's jump into this. Okay. KYC AML. That's why. Yeah. What's we, uh, what's your if you could episode. summarize in in a sentence what your so you have a hard line position about AML. I think KYC AML regulations are they do more harm than good would be my one liner. Any yeah ex, explanation beyond that would be the data collected is never secured properly and the crimes that these regulations uh, perceive to prevent they actually don't prevent them and in fact the people who are supposed to be following these regulations uh, allow the biggest perpetrators of the crimes that are trying to be prevented to get away with them. absolutely so, I agree with all those points debate over <laughs> no um <laughs> i mean look aml is not my favorite thing in the world i just happened to learn uh, a fair bit about it out of interest in staying legal um it's weird developing on bitcoin is weird because you've got the whole open source thing who funds it what's the business model that's an you know oh you got you got 100k from this company so you don't have to worry about it well that's nice but I, my, my hundred K grant was from myself to this project, you know, and it's like, I could really use that hundred K, you know what I mean? So, so for me, it was negative a hundred K and, um, but that's fine. So, you know, I think I, there's a model there. And then when you are, uh, you know, smiling on Twitter, um, all the time and you're out there and you're, you're not an anon or even a suit on, um, then, you know, fuck, what do you do? You got to comply basically because otherwise uh, you saw what happened to Ninja B guy. Who's that? N uh, Ninja B, I think it was, or Ninja coin. The guy out of Ohio. Oh yeah. Yes. The, uh, the cypher mixer or whatever. Right. Correct. 
So yeah. um, they hit him with like 53,000 odd counts of fi- failure to file SAR. And each of those carried like 20 odd grand or whatever it was. And, and it was brutal. And then the, so they were like, oh, yeah, it'll be like 200 million bucks. But we'll just we'll hit you with a 60 million because we're, we're not animals. Um, so that's a non <laughs> right. They're like, come on, this, this is ridiculous. Let's just make it around 60. Um, it's still a lot of money. So you can't discharge that in bankruptcy. I mean, he's not in prison, but he has a life. It's like a, a financial death sentence. To, to get mm-hmm. that six, as a person, if it's a corporation and then you as a person get a lesser one, sometimes that happens or like in class actions. I mean, like government enforcement wouldn't be effective if you couldn't give people the stick, I guess, right? Um, or if class actions didn't, like for instance, payday lenders, they got a billion dollar settlement against them. So that was a financial death sentence for them too, right? Um, and I think that, I don't think that was also, I'm not, that's a nuance I'm not clear on, but um, so this government power and it's, the, I'm an expat, so I've had to worry about FBAR and that's all, AML, that's the earlier stuff, right? FBAR came in from, from BSA Act and then um, with FATCA, which was, uh, you know, an Obama administration uh, project that happened. That's, that's probably the one point where the government's really oppressed me the most is that I fear penalties that are, are expensive and not, I can't, so you can do chapter 13 and break it into like easy monthly payments of a hundred thousand dollars for 50 years. Uh, that's like the other option. <laughs> that's like the legal option that this guy has at this point. Um, so they're pretty much like, screw you guys. If you run a mixer, we are going to get your butt. And, um, so what do you do? Right. So now okay, we are activating taproot, right. We're going to have better tech. So I think, like my reading of your position though, is that you think the political program of Bitcoiners should be that we all like put on our V for Vendetta masks and, and start batching taproot constructs together passively with an algo and a lightning, you know, hot wallet and so on, just, just to to give the middle finger to uh, the government. Well, as much as I love giving the middle finger to the government, I think Elaine, you actually, she has one of my favorite posts on this. Uh, the goal should be to make the regulations so expensive and s- too dumb and too expensive to to actually uh, follow through with. Like with Napster. And, or, yes. or, or, well, or BitTorrent more to the point. And, and perhaps because... BitTorrent yeah. BitTorrent's probably better. But the point being, if you can do something at the software level of the Bitcoin protocol, whether it be at the uh, protocol level or a layer above it, you can create technology that most importantly perturbs the chain analysis heuristics that are used um, by the people who would be using these chain analysis tools to implement these regulations or comply with these regulations, probably the better term there, uh, then we should do that. Uh, so that's been the detente for the last like five years or so since about 2015 has been basically it's like in the departed it's like uh, feed them shit and keep them in the dark you know so <laughs> am, I, am i right uh i think that was Wahlberg. um so yeah the chain analysis companies feed shit to the regulators and keep them in the dark because there really isn't enough metadata it becomes spurious after two or three hops uh, it's all, you know, it's all conjectural. Um, I think the way that they get the, uh, the, the mixers is they, they color their own threads into the yarn ball. You know, they, they throw in a few of their own, like how they get tore. And then you can, you can graph deconstruct the, uh, you know, the, the body politic of that, that spool. Um, and then they, if there are any loose ends, so somebody gets a UTXO out of a Tumblr and then they take it over to Coinbase so they can get it in their bank account, then there's the subpoena. So you can start to ring fence it. I, I think that's how they beat it. So with Taproot, you know, you'll get tap. The thing is Taproot has a lot of great advantages just for byte efficiency without having it be weaponized in this way. But but Marty, what you're talking about is a protest. It's it's people breaking the law and in a way that seems to be, you know, politically expressive and not terrorism per se, right? 
Uh, it's not, you're not expressing yourself by blowing up a building. You're just ge- going out there and breaking curfew. You know, how's that breaking a law? I just want some privacy. And Bitcoin is a peer to peer distributed messaging system. I'm just sending messages within a software protocol to attain privacy. So there's this not gray any drugs. Yeah, no, it's true. But there's this gray area where they get you like those cases. I remember the cases from 20. I remember the 2014 local Bitcoins scene, man. And, you know, <laughs> that shit was money laundering. And it, that's just how it were. And it was petty money laundering, of course. But they would get these guys on an entrapment style. Like, so you're here to score drugs, kind of a, like, you know, kind of a, you know, oh, yeah, sure, whatever, dude. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm totally going to use this Bitcoin to, to get some drugs or whatever, you know. And you're like, okay, I, just, I don't care. Just give me the, the dollars, you know. Um, so they'll, they'll lace that into it to make it stick. And then it's like, you know, how much is too much? How much takes you from a P2P type user to a business user? That's the gray area. And the threshold can be low. It might have been, you know, 200000 in volume that you made like a couple of grand on or whatever it was. Um, nothing, like a, like a side hustle can qualify as a business at, at some moderate volume and, and then they get you. That guy who was working for uh, BitPay in, in San Diego, fucking young, young kid. It's like, it's Charlie Shrem all over again. It breaks my heart, man. I managed to... I'm 35. I've never been to prison or, or been charged with anything. I've stayed clean. I didn't do an ICO. You know, be like me, kids. Don't go to prison. You know, don't get busted at 23 for AML shit because you might you were making an ARB on, you know, come on. Anyway. Yeah, but. <laughs> All right. So let's focus in on whether or not. Like, yes, I agree. Obviously, don't go to jail. I'm not but, advising anybody. But sometimes when people you, protest, you do go to jail for some period of time. This is true. Right. And then maybe the charges stick. So like uh y'all were criticizing the American Lawyers Guild, who are, you know, this organization, and, and there's some merit to that argument. Um, because they go around and they try to get people out of jail and, and give them, you know, cheap defense, pro bono defense when when all this stuff happens, you know. Um and then I found it to be very disconcerting how bifurcated everybody was on protest. So like, just a quick word on Chile. This is a great way to make it a like an arrow quiver. I lived in in martial law where the, the military got called in over protest escalating because the cops were getting violent and then people were, you know, and then there were fires. So then they, there were the military and then they were executing people in the street. So you think in your head, you know, well, I live in this nice place and the, there's a protocol and they're not going to just start killing people when that breaks you kind of get radicalized it's very frightening how you know there's no way to get out of the country like the the military controls the whole country and you suddenly realize it's frightening um and then there were a lot of uh oh commun they're communists or oh you know you're y'all are fast there's a lot of this polarization um and ultimately the country overcame it they did a, a referendum they're they're going to do a new uh constitutional process it's, it's really interesting i think i thought it was a nice um ending to it and then the way So the, the kind of lost in the court of public opinion a little bit. And then the uh, Panera finally was like, okay, we're done with martial law. Let's give them concessions. And then they, they got to this concession and it was big enough. Um, I, I think, it, you know, I think it really will change Chilean history. So like I, to me, that's a protest that kind of worked, right? And like Hong Kong didn't cause the CCP's boot is, is like just a tank grinder, um, just Tiananmen style just rolled over it. But, um, but God bless them. I hope they, they do better in Hong Kong. So like, I think we, we have to look at all these anti-authoritarian protests, like in Nigeria. I got devs in Nigeria, so I was like way into it. And like my buddy uh, started dating an Armenian and he got really into the Armenian thing. So, you know, we all have our biases. Um, <laughs> that's the, we all have our biases and that's okay, right? But we should respect protests that are, assume that they're not created all by George Soros. This is legitimately like millions of people are like fed up. Um, of course, there are, there are agencies at work. Um, and then we have to understand that Bitcoin is a protest at some level. At some level, it's not a protest. At some level, it's just honest to God, good technology for good settlement 
and and good economic you know monetary policy right um so we got to let those guys come in pay tx fees and keep the chain healthy as an overall economy and i know a lot of your your fans think oh you know bitcoin's going to a, a bajillion dollars it's inevitable but i'd like to think i'm living in a more nuanced reality where like it's about user acquisition it's it's about it's about these steps to getting there you know um and i love how i love your work in mining you know i think diversifying uh the base like that is is a part of it too um and you you would have to you have to like the mining is all con contextualized in political arrangements with governments that are letting you mine and when they don't it's venezuela they show up because they saw that you you spiked usage on electricity and, and they arrest you and they take the gear and then they're the miner <laughs> yeah maduro is the biggest uh, miner in venezuela right um so yeah i think yeah for the mining aspect i think we're lucky here in the United States where a lot of these oil patches, these basins, uh, go across many state lines. So if you believe in like states' rights, sure. and the ability of individual states, there's some um, separation there. Obviously, the federal government overlooks all of them. But on top of that, it goes into Canada and down into Mexico a little bit as well. Um, so you have some North American geographic and political uh, sort of arbitrage going on there, which is interesting. Well, but... and there, there that exists in the regulatory landscape around uh, DeFi and, and Bitcoin and so on as well. That's the fun thing about the U.S. You've got 50 states. Uh, you got so and so legislation created this agency with their body of admin laws, and and the whole you know Greek pantheon of those. Um, so I've had the pleasure of studying CFTC re regulation the most. Uh, because I find them to be a very eloquent agency populated by learned people who, who appreciate Hayekian. Of all the government agencies, they're the most Hayekian, are the CFTC folks. Because it's like... Yeah, the commodities peoples get it. Yeah, because they're like you're dedicating your life to risk transfer markets, like being really robustly margined and so on. Like It's because you understand that that, that, that adds value to GDP, right? Um and SEC gets that too, but SEC's uh, had a more troubled history, I would say, um, because there's more. No, I don't think there's more fraud yeah. involved so would, with, with SEC, so they have to. And the commodities futures, particularly, are arguably more integral to uh, fluid uh, facilitation of the economy, right? Being able to hedge um, weather risk. Bigger, I'd say it's production risk it's bigger than equities as far as capital formation side of equity obviously large cap volume and and how pension funds and blah 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 but like yeah that's a big deal uh of course the bond market is the biggest one of all which brings us to treasury who is the regulator for in tandem with with the fed of the banking system and then they have fincen and and um fa uh ft was the thing that started i think in 79 and it's been something they come back to so when before trump got elected in 2016, I was I was looking into common reporting standards as this OECD global dragnet, and I was really looking for. So, funnily enough, I, I came to Armenia of all places. Uh, Georgia <laughs> Georgia might have been a better choice. Georgia's people. You, you also check out Georgia mining in Georgia. Bit Fury guys from Georgia. Uh, Georgia's what's up. I think they'll they'll be a big one um, in in this whole Bitcoin mining slash industry slash banking. You know countries race uh, for small countries. Um, Armenia didn't jump on it, but um, you, the only other country that wasn't in CRS was the USA, right? And Panama Panama ended up getting into a, a sort of a taunt about CRS. Um, so I thought, okay, if Trump gets elected, there won't be CRS in the USA. They'll just stay out of it because it's too international. It's not his style. Plus Trump loves the US being the number one money laundering <laughs> place in the world. Like that's his, like that's making money. He gets it. So, okay, so we didn't get into CRS under, under the Trump term, um, which may be the first of two, or it may be, you know, we, we're still living in that uncertainty. It's, it's a nice moment uh, for the, the podcast. Um, let's not dive off into that. But um, so the thing is, Trump's guy, uh, Munch, got, got all up on, you know, and, and Trump himself was like, that, that was a part of the, the Bolton book, you know, go after Bitcoin for fraud, which is kind of misunderstanding what, what you would go after Bitcoin for. 
but but Munch was like, okay, sure, fraud really in practice that means AML violations. Yeah, let's do it. And he said, uh, what was his line? He said, at one point he like bold faced looked into the CNBC cameras. It was like nobody's ever used U.S. dollar cash for illegal activities. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, you know. Um, and yeah, and then you, on the other side of the ocean, you got guys like uh, Augustin Carson licking his chops at the idea that users of one hundred dollar bills, not owners, not not bearer owner, you know, users m- couldn't be stopped <laughs> from using their hundred dollar. Like, bro, come on. Um, so I and and here's the thing. Um, I think guys like Gorfine and and Giancarlo, who were at the CFTC when I was, I I got to talk to Gorfine uh, when he was working at Labs because I was I was trying to be nice and give the, the government my notes, um, <laughs> which was pretty much what it was, you know, because of the fragmented legal, you know, it, like the FCA can make you a contract and and be like you're going to be indemnified for this term for doing stuff with your protocol here in London, you know. Um, so that's something I might take them up on because the other thing I realized is that when you're doing these DeFi things, part of, one of the only switching costs, cause you saw how it was like, you know, yams and then hot dogs and, and because, <laughs> because they do the liquidity reward too fast. And then there's like no switching, the switching costs are you just click on something else in MetaMask and you pay the gas fees to, to unwind out of one thing and into the next. So, I mean, the gas might be a pain in the ass, but that's, that's another dimension. Um, but no, the regulation aspect, having a, de- a DeFi protocol that's P2P. So like you were complaining about um, the data security, right? So like I found a provider called Maddie, which charges a buck, um, which is like really cost competitive. Uh, four year, three, four years ago, it was about five bucks. Uh, and then you scale down to like three. So there's price competition there. And then not all of these guys do it, but they actually store uh, you know, the ID images and whatnot. So then of course, what happens if Maddie gets compromised? Uh, you know, my ID is going to be out there. It sucks. Right. Um, so that's kind of like a nice uh, McDonald's kind of way to, to do quick KYC. Um, probably for like these international lists and whatnot. Um, you can also do P to P KYC. So there's nothing in the law that says that you have to like entrust, you know, your ID information with, some third party, right? That is a bu- just a byproduct of the operating manner of these exchanges and so on, right? Um, because it's easier for them to vertically integrate it. It would be weird. They would probably feel a little weird operationally if they outsourced the storage, right? So then they get hacked and then it's a, it's a whole scandal, right? Um, or one of these FinCEN, uh, I'm, uh, FinTech legacy type companies gets hacked, right? I think PayPal had a leak. I don't remember. It's... We, we get a lot of these, right? Yeah. It's a real problem. But you can do it P2P. So it's possible that you could, uh, so Rick Dudley actually built a, a middleware for this. Uh, and I may have briefly mentioned it the last time I was on your show, um, where you do the headshot together and you, you do like the selfie and then that gets hashed and then you put that into the, the TX that like cr- cross tags your addresses and you're good to go. I mean, if, if there were any... Um, inquiry into your AML. So if you're CFTC regulated in your US trading derivatives, you still have KYC obligations. You still need to have some AML policy. You don't have to be filing SARS. You're regulated with CFTC instead of FinCEN. Whereas if you were trading uh, tokens, then you might be become FinCEN. You know, that would fall into that bucket. Um, so I think the P2P KYC is the way to go for USA. I don't like that at all. Why? Why am I sharing my information with somebody in a well? Because in a Dex, probably it's like it's a guy in Chicago, and you may have like skyped with him, and now you're gonna open a channel and and you're gonna do trade flow with him or whatever. Well, wouldn't the ideal situation in these second layer protocols be you don't even need to necessarily know your counterpart? You can just get access to an order book and get matched. Well, they, generally they're not order books; they're like indicator of interest things uh, because it's agreeing to handshake on some, you know, unicast or any cast type transaction. Right. But yeah, like you can, you can also do in trade layer. We have broadcast order books that are on chain, but they're very slow and clunky. So yeah, that exists. Uh, you can also KYC filter that, or you can do it kind of raw dog, um, as a default option. 
Um, so, you know, if people don't care about their exposure to the counterparty legal liability, then okay. And that may apply to many people in the world. Unfortunately, US citizens have extra responsibilities. So yes, we, well, like I think this is I think this is where we need to take a step back okay. and talk about the Bank Secrecy Act. Sure. And the particular regulations, like can can they be justified anymore? So Bank Secrecy Act, when was it launched? Nineteen seventy. Yeah. At the time. Right. There's no in, re- inflation. The inflation just in the seventies alone was tremendous. Ten thousand used to be like a yeah. hundred thousand. So yeah, like just a quick reform inflation index. The, the instead of tightening it why not have it be two dollars fifty cents in the future some kid can go buy a stick of gum uh for three bucks and uh he'll have to kyc and the 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 central bank digital currency will have a provenance chain so we'll make sure this kid's clean before we sell him anything well that's Um, it seems like they're going that way fincen it's talking about lowering the threshold from three thousand dollars to two hundred and fifty dollars. Oh, they're doing it. That's the beauty of administrative law. They don't have to go to Congress to change those params that are built, you know, that are framed in the original legislative All right. act. So na- yeah. So now we're getting somewhere. How are these unelected officials, uh, like FinCEN and the Financial Action Task Force? The Financial Action Task Force doesn't make laws. They provide guidelines that then usually get turned into laws by the partner. So, you know, I, re- I read the FATF document and they, they thought that the decentralized stable coins would be harder to use and wouldn't get traction. So they're, they were kind of hand waving that risk away because it's a, it's a chaotic enough thing that is legally straddling, you know, the outside of their jurisdiction that it makes them. And the, the other thing I don't like about FATF is that they would prescribe things to other countries that wouldn't be constitutional in the U S under the first amendment, but they're fucking U S thinkers so like why don't why aren't you on the same team with us guys we're, we're first amendment rights you know so i'm all about that there there are some borderline cases that could theoretically become constitutional arguments in a supreme court case or whatever right um i don't want to be the guy in the the made for tv movie who is like you know like kevin costner in the movie where he like invented the seatbelt and they're like you're crazy mm-hmm. um and yeah there are better ways to accomplish the ethical prerogative of AML, which on paper is to make the world unsafe for rich criminals is, is what it's for. Right. And well, um, you take, and I, and I'm, I'm behind that and on principle. So how do you achieve it better? Right. So what do you think? Well, I think, so we need to take another step back, even like further, another layer pun intended. <laughs> and the pun's always intended like why uh why are we going after certain people i mean you know, it's right always... and why, why did nobody go to jail for the financial crisis and we're, we're putting financial death sentences on 26 year old yeah. kids who were running software that why, why, and... why why were computer crimes more serious than uh drug distribution or murder uh sentencing guidelines for the last like 30, 40 years. Why did Aaron Schwartz kill himself at 26? Anyways, yeah. it's very sad. They, they really bullied yeah, like, him. Like, again, I'm trying to get to like, the like are these laws and the regulations that come from them justify like the war on drugs, why, abject failure? Why did they argue that downloading uh, encryption software was weapons exporting back in the 90s? So yeah. There's and, and America has really good uh, checks and balances and ju- judicial precedential lawmaking and so on. So like, yeah, there's room for people to protest. That's one approach. There's room for people to just keep making money and building up Bitcoin economically and hedging their legal risk. And that helps too, because that builds up the, the bulwark. Um, and then there's room for, uh, you know, Coin Center and, and others like them to lobby and, and so on. And uh, yeah, I think we have to be good at politics as Bitcoiners. I think we have to be like 10,000 coach bros, coke bros, but, but not K O C H. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) No, I I mean, I'm starting to come around to that. There's more and more people. Well, Quintina, you mentioned him earlier. Sam Bankman was the second biggest donor 
to Biden. Yeah, that was crazy. Well, maybe That's... maybe it's sort of like when Elon Musk got behind Trump, you know, and it was we were like, mm, Elon, they're they're just, you know, they're just putting chips down, man. Right. Right. It's like shorting uh, YFI back in the the twenty k range. Uh, it's just it's just going long and short the Trump contract. Have you seen the trading on that contract? It was beautiful. It, it, it made a it, very volatile intraday volatility of 80%. Unbelievable. Um, it had like two, it had a Bart and an inverse Bart. Ima- imagine correctly. nailing that move with leverage so that you would have gotten liquidated <laughs> if it retraced a little bit and then you ride it and then you fucking flip. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's illegal for you as person. So that's a CFTC thing. We're getting a little out of the scope and I'd like it if the C like the CFTC talked about, because I think they're staffed with, with very philosophically better thinking people than perhaps other agencies. They were putting forward guidance of, um, you know, maybe we'll have a de minimis threshold where you can, U.S. persons can go trade on foreign banks and, and go punt, you know, with some leverage. Um, as, for, as for the U.S. proper, there's a, a, an end user exemption, which I have postulated may apply to 1x hedging so that you can at least go risk off in this way. Um, and you would be trading with an eligible liquid counterparty who's like a good quality counterparty. So that's kind of the idea of the protection aspect of that. Um, so that could even be loosened up a little bit for onshore and make onshore easier. Um, but then there are people who have the licenses and went through the hoops and you saw all the drama with Ledger X about we want the the deliverable license and the cash, but actually the cash settled is, is derivative. Like cash settled is pretty in BitMEX and so on. That's it's actually, it actually works fine as a derivative. Uh, you don't really need like the, the delivery thing on Bax has actually made the re- margining requirement too high. So they haven't been able to scale volume as much. Um, so anyway, it's unfortunate that they started tweeting bullshit towards government officials. Um, don't do that. That's my legal advice. Like hold, actually, hold some actually, Bitcoin. Don't shit talk elected officials or appointed officials on the internet in public. Those are my two advices I, to people. I actually talked to somebody who was close to that Ledger X um, debacle, if you will. Um, yeah, and he he was saying that yeah, all they needed to do was just. Well, Paul needed to do was not tweet at, at the government. They would have been fun. Honestly, and I, I say this as a guy who tweets probably too much as well. Like tweeting less is generally a high probability of strategy. Um, <laughs> I agree. But I'm a writer, so I just write sometimes. You know, I just feel it in my heart. Um, okay, so so the future of Bitcoin, right? We we get to make a political process when we run different client versions of Bitcoin, and also when we talk shit over Twitter which was the whole Bitstein thing. It's like, Bitstein's like, hey guys, let's be more toxic. And there's been this movement. I've always been against this. I've always, I'm, a, I'm more on team uh, pomp, you know, because not everything Pop says is factually 100% accurate and that really peeves people sometimes. But he's, he's like a nice young man, TM, who's good at sales, who speaks to people where they are. And I saw him on Bill Burr. He handled it brilliantly. Um, and then we need versions of that for, for other demographics than, than like, you know, young white guys who are in the military and, and play, play football and eat dominoes every, every Saturday. Um, but I have a lot of respect for pop. I think the hate pop gets is, in de- is emblematic of the statistical skew that Bitcoiners have against being good at politics and being good at sales and being good at evangelism. And it's unfortunate. Um, and it's I also, think yeah, I, I agree. I love what pop's doing. I think he's doing an incredible job of getting a bitcoin marketing pitch out to the normies if you will yeah i guess to steel man this play a bit of devil devil's advocate against that particular argument is is the putting on is putting on your your suit and playing ball with the traditional financial with the traditional system uh, a sort of trojan horse to handcuffing bitcoin which is interesting because that's what you want to talk about are we actually destroying bitcoin's value prop by by putting it in the hands of these many custodians and do right. the 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 pretty boy clean face put your suit on and, and meet these people at the table types uh lead to uh the co-opting of of bitcoin and it's right and then we would have like dj Khaled says we would have played ourselves because we would have been like, no, but the NY agreement, we can't let never again. But then we, 
but NY wins anyway, you see. Um, you know, Mnuchin's from NY, right? Like it's that whole, that whole vibe. So, um, so what I propose for Bitcoin, my moderately liberal, as far as risk bias goes, uh, irrespective of how that correlates to the rest of my politics, um, <laughs> my, my moderately liberal sort of centrist technocrat, but libertarian centrist technocrat prescription for Bitcoin is that, okay, look at Ethereum. Ethereum had a ton of R&D threads. They had things that were like replicating Lightning. I think Lightning has been building on layers of abstraction in order to route around things that could be solved just by activating a new opcode, right? So clearly like, you know, like Raiden didn't become a big thing on Ethereum, right? So what they had different kinds of rollups. They, they found, or, you know, they had Plasma and like what's the trade-off between rollups and Plasma. So they, they allowed so much shit to go on. And like IOHK is a more vertically integrated thing like this, but they pump out tons of cool R&D threads as well, right? So that's maybe a different vibe than what Bitcoin's about because we're not trying to like cover all the base or like these professor coins, right? Um, so we're definitely, we're trying to stay more scoped. We're trying to keep Bitcoin composability more like particle physics than like uh, chemistry, right? Where you've got all the Turing possibilities. Um, but then it can become chemistry if you, if you have that good foundation. Um, but also the range of applications in Bitcoin that we need are not so ginormous, right? We need like some lending contracts, some, some trading, some derivatives, and, and we're pretty good, pretty much good to go. You know, a little tokenization for the, the risk off and for the, the capital formation. Uh, like I want to get a North American mining company to securitize vertically integrated real estate, uh, refresher clause to keep the, the Bitcoin denominated cash flow up. Uh, like, I want to see that, you know, I want to make that happen uh, on trade layer. Um, What's that stack look like? Well, okay. So I've talked with uh, with a few people about difficulty futures and how in, in the extrapolation of a Bitcoinization model, you, ask, you need a denominator to trade Bitcoin against. That's not USD when USD becomes passe. So like just yesterday, I decided not to include a gold pair in the native ecosystem of trade layer. Um, but there are difficulty derivatives that are native, which, but you have to collateralize it in something other than raw Bitcoin because that's the limitation of trade layers. So I was thinking get an ASIC manufacturer to securitize and then post that as collateral. And so the manufacturer can show up with their insider holding stock, you know, and start, start selling these. Then they're getting uh, the roll yield. So they're getting a uh, treasury income while they're in that one and a half year, two year slump of, of like capex invested before you start to you know start shipping um and you can Isn't you can pre-sell right but this is a better form of financing than that um, yeah i was gonna say like is this like an obelisk type model or what they try to do uh that was the early omni implementation where there was an obelisk server and then there were like consensus issues so what craig sellers did in 2014 is he said we're going to do an alternative bitcoin client and so there's going to be one consensus hash. Now it's a vector for each activation sequence uh, so that if you're out of step, you can, you can read that. Um, and so that's what we've, we've built with trade layers, an alternative Bitcoin client. So my vision for Bitcoin is we do uh, flag day activations that core can like say, yeah, okay, they did find code. Like we'll, we'll pull it in and we'll, you know, so just to be thorough. And if they get the flag day activation, then we'll go along with it, right? Or maybe they have their editorial and Luke Dastard thinks I'm too much of a Jesuit or whatever. Um, and <laughs> so he doesn't want to merge it, right? But that's not the end of the world either if your node is sufficiently, if your client is sufficiently popular. So maybe I can get a lot of people in, in developing countries to uh, farm a little node reward for whatever marginal profitability there is in that. Maybe I can, I can get ahead that way. And then I'll, ha ha, I'm going to Craig Wright everybody. Ha ha, just kidding. I won't. Um, and that, and you, you, it's hard to do anyway. It, you, we saw that was very expensive. They tried to do it with MBCH. Um, but yeah, of course, I always try to make friends with miners um, for this reason in part, uh, but also for the, the deal flow. So yeah, like then my thing can be like one prescription. So I'd like to get an opcode where you can tokenize the Bitcoin in one TX. And then I can take that token and go lose it to a bunch of different people. And they can come and get, you know, one Satoshi granularity redemption natively instead of having the spot trade it for some synthetic Bitcoin or, or some stable coin, right? Um, but then there are other paths 
um, and then there's interoperability between them, which is also pretty cool. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if we have enough time to dive too deep into that, but, but please, if you have any. The first question was going to be like, do dust limits mess up that granularity? Um, I suppose it would be down to uh, the relay threshold would be the, the actual atomic granularity. But that, that I suppose if the relay threshold in a given, oh, well, yeah, the relay threshold is a local, a local thing. So it would have to be at, at the deeper level configured to some dust threshold, some relay threshold. And then I guess you would have to, hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure about refreshing that as, as a soft forks calibrate that that's a good point um so that's you already threw out a technical kink in my plan already so i appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> that's that's just what i was saying well no that's a great nuance to just bring up yeah no because doing that like on chain with like fees and stuff like that especially like how just expensive does that get also that's a, that's another good point well with the uh with the trading because you can do it bilateral and you can cash these transactions uh intraday that, that gives a little bit of scaling slack but uh yeah as far as the the really convex scaling like the lightning uh stack i think is is a pretty decent one um and then for the really high scaling you've got these side chains which are like half a half a centralized exchange anyway right um and maybe we can make them more robust uh so i've got yeah, five you... five different activation codes for different interop approaches uh that um, i've got one blocked out for ctv uh, maybe we can use CTV in conjunction with tokens where the tokens are collateral. And then you can like, if you repay them, it'll, it'll trigger, um, it's conditions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Like I'm, I'm interested in, in all of those, um, side chain proofs as a way of anchoring a state channel and you can reserve tokens to be used on the side chain. I'm interested in that. Um, a few others. So basically like maybe I'm wrong and like maybe my technical, roadmap isn't quite as good as the other ones, but maybe I'm bringing something to the table that complements what other people are doing. So I think we should consider a few different branches, let these clients compete for users. There's going to be some value added functionality the clients bring to the table in terms of their, their layer functionality. Um, and then we can let Bitcoin evolve this way so that we are doing things P2P if we do it sporadically enough under current law, we're safely under the threshold of being a business. If we are a business, there will be some, some means of uh, tag teaming with each other to cover our butts legally that way, or using some of these lists. Um, and then you'll have the, y'all, y'all will be doing your thing, launder, helping people launder money and shit. And, Maybe. I don't want to help people on their money. Okay, good. So you're, you're you're acting in good faith. That's a good legal defense. Do you want to get that on the record? Um, but <laughs> if you're following your patriotic civic duty, still might not be enough in court. But um, but the point is that it's a dialectic, and that we you can't escape politics. You can't escape governance. What you have to do is find a crappy compromise that's kind of reasonable and kind of considerate and and. Um, Ultimately, over 10, 20 years, I do think that Bitcoiners and, and Bitcoin related industries will become a political way that can help retool these laws to make them more, more effective at targeting criminals and more, effect, less, more effective at not externalizing costs onto people, onto the poorest people. That's the other thing, right? Yeah, onto 99.9% .9 of law abiding citizens. Yeah, when you, uh, when, you, when you make uh, a Walmart min wage and you pay $10 a month in maintenance to Bank of America, at some level, you're bearing the cost of bankers getting rich off of laundering the money of, of criminals. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that well, sucks. Then, so to bring it back to preventing Bitcoin from becoming this centralized custodied network that eventually bifurcates because you have a whitelisted yeah and then and, and then there are these the penalties of, on the tradability of, of certain tranches of bitcoin but which we would not like bring to it see. yeah no and that's why i like things like lightning pool um that really incentivizes naturally people to go the non-custodian route so comparing yes. lightning pool and the rate of return you can get on bitcoin locked up in a channel to a centralized solution like BlockFi, I think this is a non-custodied 
uh, or self custody uh, non custodial solution that economically it's, incentivizes it's people to get off exchange absolutely it's certainly a step in the right direction i'm all for it i think it's very elegantly designed i'd be curious to think about interop designs with with that kind of because that's composable in, in vanilla bitcoin essentially right um there's no new op codes required but what i'm saying is we need we need to get a little bit more liberal about innovation in bitcoin so that we can do more primitives more you know so like right now we're working with the quark, the electron, and like the W boson. We need the Z boson, then we can get some fusion. You know what I'm saying? Like, just a, just a few more a few more bosons, man. That's all I'm asking for. Do we really need them at the protocol level? Like, I, I like the second layer innovation. Well, particularly, the and weren't the opcodes disabled because they were too big of an attack vector? Yeah, like, no, I'm thinking about more hard coded logics that are flexible enough to be effective and, and we don't have to clutter them. So a more modest um, proposal from a, a, a Bitcoin conservative who's very technical, uh, who I like to talk to, uh, a guy named Thomas Hartman. He wants to do something called op energy, where it's just like a native reference on um, on a composite of like the block time and the difficulty and a few other things so that you can trade Bitcoin natively against difficulty, which is really a proxy for energy, right? And just do that. And he had a model where you, you have these binary Bitcoin outputs settle, and then you compound them. Jeremy Rubin was, was fucking around with a similar thing with the DLCs, which, which involve an Oracle, right? So op energy would be like an Oracle list DLC kind of setup um, so that you can have P2P yeah, minor for minor to whomever trading going on. Yeah, the ch it chains the Oracle at that point, right? Right. And so the, the trade off there is you, you could make a compound binary option that looks more like a, a vertical spread. So it, it kind of is smooth, almost as if, uh, if you just went long a perp right? and you're just delta one leverage. Um, but you blow the transaction by chaining the compounds. Um, so there's a byte trade off there. And then Schnorr like, gets you a lot of savings on that. So like that's a more conservative roadmap that gets you a little bit of DeFi, and and at the very least, Bitcoin needs to do something like the Bitcoin community needs to maybe demand is too strong a word that's too toxic, but request <laughs> politely that that we go at least that far, um, and then what Trade Layer does is it has without you know UTXO for token trading to get onboarded, so however liquid that is, however liquid the basis is in the the perpetual swap on the on the meta coin versus uh, the native you know, Litecoin or Bitcoin. Um, and that's kind of like, well, you know, you wouldn't want to put your whole stack in that because you wouldn't want to be exposed to all that risk, but you get a little Bitcoin yield, right? So there's going to be a bigger spectrum than just like the lightning reference router rate or a few durations on that. There will also be a little, you know, take a little basis risk on this DeFi system, get more yield or take a little credit risk, get more yield. Um, and then if we saw Bitcoin, there's also the dollarization angle. You'll get a higher rate in dollars than you will in, in a Bitcoin exposure, right? So we get this whole menu out and then the whole world gets to pick what's right for them and what portfolio works for them. And the privacy stuff is another, you can think of it as a portfolio allocation. You don't have to be all in on dark wallet or what have or on Wasabi or something. Uh, you, you got a little money in your pocket for, you know, the gulag is coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got your bug out Bitcoin where now Taproot and other things is not a civil protest. It's a survival tool, right? And then meanwhile, you're a gray man. You're following the law. You're paying your taxes. You've got your, you know, your white Bitcoin is like clearly tagged with metadata from how you, how you jumped around with it. Uh, and, and then you might as well be using DeFi with that Bitcoin anyway, <laughs> if you're going to be. In fact, that should be the Bitcoin you use for DeFi because that's the Bitcoin that you're kind of willing to lose to margin, but then if the market goes down, you got your hedge on or, or whatever, you, you're going long and you're taking some risk. So I don't know if I like this. I don't know if I like this. I'm talking about like 10% like... of your stack, 5% of your stack. I know, but it doesn't seem like these Bitcoins are fungible at that point. Uh, no, that's what I'm saying is you can have a position in, in, like you can embrace the bifurcation, have a position in both, and then wait out the, the longer term political process. And, and use them for what they're useful for. So, I'd rather expedite so like, that longer term political process, just make it unnecessary. If AOC won the presidency and announced the gulagging of all Bitcoiners in America, but you, but not until the inauguration is over. So you got, 
you got like a bug out window. Then you could take your taproot coins to Argentina and sell them and, and you'd be probably all right. You know, that's what I'm saying. The goal is never to sell though, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, to, to survive or what have you. Yeah, it's always yeah, good to have a cash flow. Yeah, we should never get to that point. Subsidize, yeah. We should never get to the point where AOC is gulagging us. I think well, that's why I think. Well, I'm joking anyway. And... AOC is a nice young lady. She's not going to gulag anyone. She has bad. She's going to gulag. She's going to gulag. She has bad ideas she about gets... economics. Uh, she's very good at PR, and and she's not going to gulag anybody. I was just joking. Nobody's she's getting gulags except maybe the ice detainees. But anyways, if you got if you guys aren't if you guys aren't careful, we're gonna we're all gonna get gulagged. And I think uh... there's always gulag <laughs> risk. And, you know, some people got gulagged in Chile, uh, but they were not Bitcoiners. They were political activists. A lot of the, the people who were like, oh, this is a communist thing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they were Bitcoiners. That was the funny part is we'd have that conversation. And then, I, then I'd be like, well, I think you should just get Bitcoin. And he's like, of course, I have Bitcoin. Because <laughs> they think, you know, the leftists are going to ruin everything. Um, so Bitcoin is great for uh, when, when leftists win because um, it pumps your bags. And then you can always avoid being gulagged if you get out in time. The hard thing is with this whole international man strategy is if you don't have another passport, it's really hard. Now you're an immigrant. It sucks. I've been through it. I'm, I'm going to keep going through it. Um, so I have a lot of empathy for immigrants. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave on that note. I have a lot of empathy for immigrants. God bless. Don't get arrested. But if you do, make sure it's for a good cause. I agree. All right. I mean, yeah, don't get arrested. But I think we should protest. I if you're getting arrested for drunk in public, you're wasting your arrest card on something that isn't yeah. civic. <laughs> Send it. Send it. All right. You're not going to get in the history books for, for getting arrested for being drunk in public. No. Um, but you can for Patrick, what... standing up to power. It's true. Patrick, it's uh, always a fascinating conversation with you. Yeah, this Lord, was really uh, good. This might be the most time-condensed uh uh, you know, episode you've ever done. Well, we got a lot in. We did. Uh, is there anything we should let the freaks know before we wrap up here? Any parting thoughts? Um, I'd love it if you would come follow me on Trade Layer. I don't expect the the Hodel Core to be my biggest users with this thing, but uh, you know, come check it out. And uh, it's like DeFi and Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, come follow us. Where can we find it? Uh, at Trade Layer on Twitter. We're, we're posting oh, updates. Yeah. We're about to drop a, a release with like CLI, which is not, you know, for, for a few people might dig it. Uh, and then we're following up with front end soon. We're going to start trading. Love it. Yeah. I've been waiting to see trade layer go live. So me too. Sounds like <laughs> I've been waiting. Sounds like it's ready. I've been waiting about 15, 20% of my whole lifetime. <laughs> if you count back to 2014. Yeah. All right. We will, um, we will put a link to Trade Later Square in the show notes. Patrick, thank you for coming on as always. Thanks a lot, Again, Marty. This was a, a love our respectful civic discourse. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you got to have, you got to flush these things out. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, uh, the message you freaks and leave with is just like, try not to get gulagged. That's what we're Don't here Don't get for. gulagged if you can help it. <laughs> yes. That's all we got, freaks. Peace and love.